morning, church. Today's text is Luke 4, 16 through 30. Uh, this can be found on page 807 of the Pew Bibles. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the, and the, scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may find your seats. I want to pray this morning, not just for our time together, uh, but also I think we have about seven people from our church getting ready to go to Honduras uh, for a medical mission trip. So I want to lift them up uh, to the Lord as well. Uh, Let's bow together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, the privilege of serving you. Thank you for the beauty of your, your gospel as we sing it, Lord, in these songs that you've given people the capacity to put things to paper, uh, Lord, both musically and in lyric, that stir our hearts and minds. And we just, we just confess to you, Lord, that we are grateful for the gifts that you've given to the body because they encourage our souls. We've been encouraged this morning by the singing, by the reading of scripture, by the prayers. And we just ask that that, that, that spirit of encouragement would continue on through our time together as we meditate upon your word, we pray that you would quicken us, you would strengthen us, Lord, that your word would exhort us and challenge us, that it would rebuke us and bind us up, Lord, as we gather to contemplate those things that you have left for us in your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this world, for being the missionary from God to bring life and light to those in darkness and in death. And we just give you praise. And we would ask, Lord Jesus, that this morning you would favor us with a quickening of the spirit of mind and heart for those who are believers and for those who do not know you, Lord, that you would open their eyes to the beauty of who you are. And the word of God going forth might affect their souls as as it has affected ours, that they might uh, be brought into our body of Christ, Lord, and enjoy the knowledge of the sealing of the Holy Spirit and the promises of heaven and the joys of what expects or what we are to expect and what awaits for us there in your presence. And Lord Jesus, as these go out from our midst here soon to go preach the gospel and use, Lord, medicine to to help give some reflection of the healing power of the gospel upon our souls, Lord, and also just to alleviate some of the pain that these people have, I pray that you would make their evangelism efficacious, Lord, cause it to find root in the hearts and minds of those that they go to serve. They are an extension of us, Lord Jesus, and I pray then that you would cover them with your grace and your protection and your power and your anointing. Lord, that that would be a transformational trip for them, that you would cause them to see your strength and power in ways that they have not yet seen, that they might come back here encouraged and strengthened to continue on in faithfulness and in proclamation of the word of God here in this place. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. Lord, I lift up those who are in our midst this morning that are struggling with life issues, whether it be physical pain or, or just, just unaware of how to fix things in our body or 
Lord, knowing that they will have to live with something the rest of their life, uh, Lord, or, or things of the mind that are just hard to get your finger on. Lord, I pray for these with these burdens that you would have mercy upon them, that you'd give them strength and grace to bear up in this time of their need. I pray also for rescuing for them according to your will, that you would, Lord, release them from these pains that are in their life at the appropriate time. And then, Lord Jesus, for those who have different kinds of needs, whether they be physical, Lord, financial, I pray that you would bless them with provision, that you would bring people into their lives, Lord, that can help them to, to just succeed in life. I, I lift them up to you. I pray for our students, for grace and strength and mercy. They're in a campus that's just void of the truth of Christ. As they go out and spread the light of Christ onto that campus, I pray that you would, you would give them success, not just in their spiritual well-being, and they're flourishing there, but just also in, in their academic work, Lord, and what you call them to do. Keep them safe from the evil one, the philosophies of the world, I pray, as we pray for our own souls and minds as well. Thank you for this time. I pray, God, that you would just guide me now, uh, that what would be seen and heard today would truly be those things that your spirit is working on and through this text to your people this morning, that we might all leave here encouraged by your grace and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are back in our study of Luke, and as it has been read, thank you for those who participated already in the service and the reading this morning. It's really just an amazing passage of Scripture. If you remember, in Luke chapter 4, we began our consideration uh, of basically the Spirit of God driving Jesus into the wilderness to be tested by the evil one, and it really was for the very purpose of of Jesus taking the place of Adam, the second Adam, so to speak, if you remember uh, th those kinds of connections from our sermon last week. And really a wonderful message, uh, or wonderful message from Luke in this particular section with regard to what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. And if you remember, he finishes the section there of Jesus basically uh, overcoming the evil one. The evil one flees, and, and, and we know from other gospels that angels minister unto Jesus. And, and he finishes this section with this focus on Christ's power to go and preach. So look at verse 14 of chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit of God, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Uh, this is really just kind of a, 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 a launching into what is called the Galilean ministry. Jesus is going to focus a lot of his time in that region of Galilee, and and. Uh, Luke is basically giving us a synopsis of what Jesus was going to be doing now for that rest of the time period. And that is, obviously, we know he healed people, but the primary focus of Christ's life was proclamation. And I want you to focus on something and kind of put it in the back of your mind for a minute, uh, because we're going we're gonna to see uh, really what this preaching entails, uh, hopefully in a moment. It says that Jesus returned in power... Uh, that's a specific word that's used there uh, in the Greek for power, and that's where we get our word dynamite from. And then if you look at chapter 5, uh, verses 17 all the way through 26, we're buttressed again by this explanation of power uh, and what Jesus Christ is doing. Look at verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has, in your text it might read authority, in other texts it might read power, that's another word that is used for power in the New Testament. It's exousia. It's a power of right. One is the power of might. Another is the power of right. And it says that you might know that the Son of Man has this authority, this power on earth to forgive sins, and then he heals the paralytic man. The purpose of Luke showing us these things is that we must understand that what is about to take place here is God's power confronting the power of this world and the power of darkness that is present uh, just through our sin and through the, 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 the world philosophies, uh, the, 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 the perspectives that are against and contrary to the things of the Lord. And we will see that Jesus Christ overcomes those things, which is really important just even on the onset of what we're talking about here, because you and I are not part of a religion that will fail. And we may fail uh, often in our Christian lives, but we have to understand, as we do every Sunday morning in our confession, that Jesus Christ restores us and he strengthens us and he encourages us to remember that we are going home one day, that there is a journey that we are on. So be strengthened, loved one, in your faith as you struggle sometimes and wonder what God is doing and how you're going to get there. Christ has won the day. We are on a journey. The victory has been won. We can rest in him. 
But let me just give you some background for this text just by way of introduction, which I think is helpful. We get some of this basically from John's work. And then even going into our section with verse 16, where it says, and he came to Nazareth. Now, Nazareth, remember, is where he grew up. This is Jesus' first message that he's going to preach to the people that knew him. He grew up with these people. You ever had one of those first in your life? You know, first recital, your family's all there. First game where everybody's going to watch you play, whatever that sport was. Uh, first, whatever it is, you know, that you're going to do. First play, first time that you're going to be in front of everybody and your family's there. There's some nerves, right? Those butterflies, can you remember those butterflies? You're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And the, the, the sweaty palms or the sweat under the arms and all those kinds of things. This is Jesus' first message to everybody that he grew up with. He has just defeated the evil one. Now, we, knowing that, we kind of know the end of the story. We're like, what just happened, right? I mean, all these people that knew him were so affected by the word of God that they're just compelled in awe. And before long, they're so angry that these people that knew him are like, hey, let's just go throw this cat off the cliff because <laughs> we can't stand him anymore. What, what has to happen and what transpires in the hearts and minds of people that can do that, especially people that know Jesus Christ? So there's a tension that's innate in the text that actually we can't ignore. Because I don't know about you, but none of us have been to the place where like our family was throwing tomatoes at us or something for our first recital or whatever it might have been. Nothing definitely as serious as this. We may have been teased about something, but this is the text, the context in which Jesus uh, is doing and performing this particular work. And it's on the heels, by the way, of what John tells us in chapter 2, where there's this wedding in Cana of Galilee. So it's kind of a busy week for Jesus. He shows up to Nazareth. In that area, Cana of Galilee is about four miles away from, from Nazareth. The Sabbath day, obviously, he's in the temple, or excuse me, in the synagogue, and he's teaching there. But there, the Cana of Galilee, he performed this amazing miracle of, of basically making about 60 gallons of wine. It was tested. It was better than anything that was being drunk. It was a blessing to those uh, that were being married. They could have sold it. They could have used it for the rest of the party, whatever it was. And, and the servants knew about it. So all of that information is kind of just filtering around over there. John the Baptist has a few disciples that are wondering about Jesus and, and, and are following Jesus around at times. And all of that's in the background. And Jesus comes and preaches this message, and they want to kill him. But he also preaches a message that leaves them in absolute grace and in mercy. So I hope I don't do as good of a job as Jesus did. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not so sure I want to get thrown off a cliff. <laughs> Just kidding, obviously. I want Jesus to, he, to, be, to be working in and through us and through this time together. What we see here this morning, and I want to focus on basically four things that our text shows us through what Jesus is teaching here and how he's leading us. And that is considering the, the, the proclamation. We're, we're shown several things here. The power and primacy of proclamation, the peril of proclamation, and the principle of proclamation. Let's begin with the power and primacy of proclamation. This is actually really interesting if you think about it. I want to work back uh, from the, the entire narrative for a moment and working back with respect to the response that was given. Uh, really, because it helps us to see something very important, and that is that there's no neutrality in what Jesus Christ is preaching. You don't see anyone in this particular passage saying, I just, I think I need to talk to Jesus about this application point later. There's, there's no like, you know, I'm going to work this out later with Christ, or, hmm, I wonder. There's an immediate visceral response to the things that Jesus Christ is teaching. Or there's a receptivity towards the grace that Christ is proclaiming as well. Because it does say that they were amazed by the gracious words that were coming out of the mouth of Christ. They were marveling at what Jesus Christ was saying and doing. And it really shows us something about what we see in Scripture as a theme. And that is that, that there are only two paths in this world. One seeking Jesus and one rejecting him. The level of rejection is... You know, it can be commensurate with the kinds of things that are going on with Christ's life right now. It could be this kind of shunning and pushing him away. Whatever it is, the rejection is always a quieting of the conscious, conscience with respect to what Christ is saying to us at that time. What his word is telling us, what we're learning and gleaning from the word of God as he is reflecting something of his nature and of his grace. And we must be aware of that because all of us at any given point might be inclined as they were, the people that knew him and were familiar with Jesus Christ, were inclined to quiet the storm of conviction that was happening in their lives. We can be found to be wrestling with God ourselves, even as Christians. Remember Peter? Jesus, you're not going to the cross. 
And Jesus actually has to tell him, get behind me, Satan. He calls him the devil for not getting behind the works of Christ. This isn't just a Christian, non-Christian thing. This is a every day I must submit my will to receiving what Christ would have in his word for me, to his convicting power, to the spirit working in my soul so that I might be challenged and growing in the things that the God has given me to understand. And this is really interesting then when we think about what Christ is proclaiming because he shows us that he has power to bring good news to the poor, power to liberate captives, power to recover sight to the blind, power to liberate the oppressed, power to declare the year of the Lord's favor. This is all from Isaiah chapter uh, 4 we see in verse 18 through 19. He basically reads these things. And it's interesting because everybody in that synagogue would have known that there were some things that were left out of that section. Verse 19 uh, is a kind of a part A to a verse that's read in Isaiah. Let me just show you this with Isaiah chapter 61. This is Jesus reciting this to the people. The spirit of the Lord of God, the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to uh, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and what's missing from our text in, Matt, in Luke. Do you see it there? and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn. This is a time when Jesus Christ is concerned about the work of grace and mercy. And the encouraging part and the warning of Christ that he leaves out in this particular section that we know is coming, the encouraging part is, my friends, that whatever hardship you're facing now from those who disdain all that is righteous is that Jesus Christ will have his day. Do you remember what he says in Deuteronomy that Paul picks up on in Romans chapter 12? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. There are scars and there are sins in our lives and the lives of those of you who are here that are too deep to even share. And you need to know that there is a day coming when there will be an exacting uh, for that sin. There, there will be a measure of God's justice upon those who have done those things upon you that will rectify the deepest pain in your soul. But right now we find ourselves in a time of grace where people might understand the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and be strengthened in that. This is Jesus basically saying, this is my focus right now. This is my primary focus, and that is to, to have you see this, this restoration of poverty, this restoration of, of brokenheartedness to a place of wholeness, this this freedom from being captivated by all these things that might keep us bound and not able to embrace and enjoy the things of the Lord, to, to, be, to be free from these bondages and these prisons that we find ourselves in in this world. And, and what should strike us in all of this as we see this consideration of power is that there is this sense that somehow Christ's proclamation is sufficient to do this which tells us this is more than just physical. This has to do with the mind and the heart, something internally that God needs to fix and to change in our lives. I mean, just think about what it would be like if someone comes to you with a need and you're like, I declare to you that it'll be okay. <laughs> you're like, get out of here, man. I didn't come for that. And in a sense, that's exactly what Jesus Christ does. What happens in the proclamation of Christ saying, be free, be lifted up, be encouraged, be strengthened, that absolutely gets to the heart and the mind and the restoration that is necessary in that mind that frees us from these kinds of things. This is, this is something, again, that underscores what we saw at the very beginning of this message, that what Jesus Christ is focused on is, is this dynamic power, this, this mighty power to change us not just physically, because redemption isn't just a, a redemption of the mind and the heart. Redemption is a redemption of the body. Christ will one day consummate everything he's uh, started to do in this salvation work, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and new bodies will be given to us. There's power in that. There's this dynam dynamite power in that. But there's also authority of God to say, be free, and it would happen. And it kind of takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it? God speaks and life happens. See, this is exactly what's going on in this section that Jesus Christ is highlighting about himself. Isaiah chapter 61 is actually a fulfillment or a, 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 a finishing of 
a whole theme of the suffering servant of Jesus Christ, this person that God had picked, this suffering servant that God had picked to accomplish a work of salvation for his people. You remember Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. And ultimately, this suffering servant would be the servant who leads his people to victory and to grace and strength. This is a culmination of all of those things. Jesus Christ is saying, I'm the one who does this. I have the power of might and the power of right to accomplish these kinds of things in your life. Let's just think about this for a moment from a Christian perspective. I want to take you, for example, there to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe it is. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip over there. First Corinthians and let's see if I can get it I may not be able to find it because I can't see it very quickly but it's in this section it's talking about Jesus Christ changing us for the word of God is folly to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved is the power of God Where's the wise? And it goes through this whole section. And then it comes to verse 2. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, but I decided for you to know nothing among, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and message were not plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Do you see that? Kind of getting the same thing. This transformation happened in the Corinthian church because of this power and this mercy that is being imparted now of Jesus Christ to his disciples, to those who are going to proclaim the word of God. And if you go thir thir uh, further into that section, he talks about all these different kinds of sins that reflected the life of those Christians. And he says, as such were some of you, the Christian life with respect to understanding this power can say, God has delivered me from, make the list. Adultery, pornography, anger. We might still struggle with those kinds of things. On some level, you know, you see all sorts of struggles within the Christian community. But that commitment to those sins is gone. The power of those sins is gone. We can have these moments of victory, which before Jesus Christ, we had none of those things. Christ has done something so effective in our lives that those things that which once owned us, which we didn't even care, were right or wrong. We have left at the feet of Christ to find our victory in him and to rest in him. Have you found that testimony to be true in your own life if you're a Christian? To see those things that Jesus Christ has changed in your life. To know that these wrestlings that you bring with him or to him will find success, will find, you will find victory in by God's grace. And if you are in a place where you're wondering how in the world you get out of this bondage, I would just tell you what Jesus Christ tells his disciples, that we are to, Ephesians chapter 6, if we can connect it, put on the whole armor of God. We're to walk in the spirit and we will not, we will not fulfill the, the, less, the desires of the flesh. This is, this is an issue of leaning in upon the spirit's power. This is exactly what Jesus Christ is doing as he's proclaiming, as he's functioning to bring change. Have you thought about that in your own life? And if you do not know the Lord, I would just ask, what is it that you're trying to do? What is it that you're reaching for that's helping you succeed in your mind? Because our experience has been that the things that we just kind of reach for to help us overcome deep heart issues end up becoming an idol or a slavering, an enslaving thing again. I'll just give you a quick example of this with somebody that I knew a long time ago, a painter who had quit smoking here in South Carolina, uh, he he uh, was worried because a family member who had smoked all their life uh, had, had actually um, produced some cancer, and so he just quit smoking, and then all of a sudden, he walked around with sunflower seeds everywhere, right? It's like, that was his thing to get him again. He would eat so many sunflower seeds. They would just, as he was speaking to you, those seeds would just kind of dribble out of his mouth. It was really, it was hard not to look at him at just his mouth when he was talking. Like, you were not hearing anything he was saying. You're just seeing these things come out the whole time. It's like he traded one, he traded one, uh, one addiction for another, in that, and that's exactly what the world does. Silly example, just to show you how often when we don't look for Christ, we trade one thing we think has power for another, and then we find that it's empty. I am trying to get you to a place to hear what Jesus Christ is saying. He has the power to transform 
the power to change, the power to renew, the authority to do these things. And he's focused upon that inner being before he's even focused upon the physical. The very first thing Jesus Christ does, look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 21, verse 31. The very first thing he does after his message and he gets out of the danger that he's in is that he tells a man who's demon-possessed to be free. And the demon leaves, and that's power. This is what we're talking about. What, is, what are you captured by? Come to Jesus and let that lay at his feet that he might bring you deliverance and strength. This is the kind of power we're concerned about. He's, he, he is working in the inner part, the inner man, the, the things that we can't touch. And to show that that's his primary purpose, even all these healings that we have in chapter 5, he finishes with the healing that I told you about, a paralytic man. Look at what he says in verse 20 of chapter 5. And when he saw his faith, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. This is that section where these guys come and they lower this, this paralytic into the middle of the room where Jesus is because they can't get in. And they're expecting Jesus to heal. And Jesus' response is, your sins are forgiven? What does that tell you about the primacy of his work. It's a soul issue first before it's a physical issue. It's gospel in here, not just the action. And the only reason, the primary reason, I should say, that he heals him physically is, verse 24, that they may know that the Son of Man has power, authority to forgive sins. We're talking about a new man. We're talking about transformation this is why the Christian, who, the person who comes to faith, doesn't come just to get a bag of goodies from Jesus. If you're coming to faith, it's because you know that you need that change from Christ. You know you need that heart change. And it actually is very protective to us from this standpoint. That if Jesus Christ is working on this level, what in the world can I do that's really going to change my heart? Every worldview that I reach for, every change, every speak truth to power kind of thing is just a repackaging of stuff to try and change things that can never reach my heart. That's why Christ came, to deliver us even from those things that bind us in our thinking. He has the power to change us. He has been anointed by the Holy Spirit to deliver us from the poverty of thinking that robs us of beauty and joy in resting in Jesus, that, that to deliver us from this, from this captivity of falling to one philosophy after another, of, of, of finally being able to see the beauty of Jesus Christ and what's truly going to lead us into the presence of most holy God for eternity. And to know that Jesus Christ is now working the year of the Lord's favor, the time where Christ is calling people to a place to understand his grace and his mercy and not the day of vengeance, though it is coming. Now, this is really amazing because if you think about what Christ does then later after his crucifixion and resurrection is that he gives us a task. You remember that task? Matthew 28, 18, all exousia, all power is given me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You and I as Christians are given the mandate to function as Jesus did. Yes, we do what we can physically, but if we want to change the world, it's not just by building hospitals and bridges or digging wells. You want to change the world, you've got to give the one who changes the heart. If we're not preaching Jesus, we're just being humanitarian. But the moment we bring Jesus into something, we're proclaiming in the authority of Jesus Christ, be free. Oh, dear friends, do you see that? Are you walking in that path? Does this guard your soul from distracting you from the primary responsibilities of the Christian life. And here's the basic point of all of this, that these attributes are attributes which only belong to God, and Jesus, who is the eternally begotten, is equal with God. He comes into the world to proclaim in power all that God had commanded him to speak. God is concerned about the soul and the body and is speaking to redeem them both. And I have a question for you then. What worldview has the world ever developed that has power to do that? 
I want you to fall in love with Jesus again. I want you to be captured by his beauty, by his mercy, by his grace, by the freeing power that he gives us so that you might be able to rest in his joy and function and thrive in the beauty of what Christ has done and called you to. The power of proclamation. Now let's consider now quickly two other points and that is the peril of proclamation. I bet you can guess where this is going, right, from this text. And this is really just a brief point that I want to underscore. But basically, we have here Jesus preaching. And they all got really sideways about it at the very end, right? It's like Jesus Christ put his finger right on the nerve that was being affected by all of this. And I highlight this because as we go and serve and are faithful... If we are functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit, we ought not to expect anything differently than what Jesus Christ has already displayed in his own life, right? If they do this to the master of the house, how much more to his servants, Jesus says at one point. We need to remember, for instance, like Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, Jesus Christ, or the, the, uh, the apostles are preaching, and they, they get incarcerated because of their preaching, and it says that, in, that, that they were preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit was upon them to preach these words, just like you and I will have when we are faithful to these things that God has given. And, and there was a perception that these people have been with Jesus. They recognized, man, these guys have some, uh, some, some, some things that only God can do, only Christ could have done in their life. Acts chapter five, they keep preaching, and finally they're beaten for the fact that they are preaching. We told you to stop speaking in this man's name. Do you see the power of preaching? They wanted all the goodies. We want the healing, but don't you dare say it's in the power of Christ. That there is power in the proclamation of Christ's name. You want a clear example of that? Quarterback just happens to mention something about Jesus, and it gets cut out of his little announcement there in one of his interviews in, in one of these recent NFL games. We can't stand to hear the word of Christ unless it's used, the name of Christ unless it's used in a swear word. Now, I'm not saying that to destroy those who cut that out. I'm trying to get you to understand that when we, in simple ways, proclaim with clarity the beauty of Jesus Christ, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is there, and people will either turn or they will do everything they can to shut that down. And you and I must be so in love with Jesus that we just don't care, that we will embrace, that we will move forward, that we will say, yes, God, whatever you have to do. As they did in Acts chapter four and Acts chapter five, when they were beaten, they rejoiced that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. How do you imagine that joy? After having watched Jesus Christ crucified and not being there to help them, the guilt that those disciples would have had, and now the opportunity to actually enter into that particular pain my friends, we are not sadistic in the Christian life. What we are is people that recognize that there are dangers to what we've been called to, but there's a greater danger of not being faithful. There's a greater danger of not actually expressing the gospel of Jesus Christ because people will not hear and people will not be transformed as you and I have been changed and transformed. Let me just give you a couple examples of things that potentially are issues that are hitting the church right now uh, around the world that are causing Tremendous turmoil, then we're trying to, we're having this battle of trying to turn that, land, that, that noise off. I just think about the fight within the broader Christian community over uh, how to clarify uh, the, the gender issue and marriage issues and, and same-sex blessings. The Roman church is in turmoil right now as a result of that. The Anglican community is having its own struggles as many in the, in the African conferences of the Anglican community are pushing back against those who had once been their missionaries bring them the gospel and saying, no, the scriptures are clear on these particular issues. The Methodist church has split over this particular issue of sexuality uh, in, in, in a way that expresses a Christian sexuality, not just heterosexuality, but sexuality expressed in a proper Christian context as God has designed it. The RCA, the PCUSA, and many non-denominational churches have all seen rifts because of clarity on the word of God on this. And we're not trying to be clear to be divisive. We're trying to be clear because if people don't hear those convicting words from the gospel, they will not turn to Jesus. 
They have to come to a place, as you and I have come, where we see that we are the ones that are trying to turn the noise of Christ off. And the consequence of that particular decision is going to lead us into his judgment as opposed to his grace, into the day of vengeance as opposed to the day of life. But perhaps another issue that we could think about, especially given our context and the conversation we're having with respect to the gospel. A lot of stuff going on with immigration right now, right? Just pull back and think about all of what's happening. There are people that are coming illegally to our country that have been in places where there's no religious freedom to talk about these things. Are we so moved by the gospel that we're able to at least recognize that perhaps God is bringing them here so we can share the gospel with them. Are we more intent on that conversation as Christians or on the political issues that drive it? Now, I came here legally, okay? I understand the, 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 legal, the, the legal work that has to happen with immigration. I thank God for the privilege of being here. I went through all of those things that you're supposed to go through and all the hoops that you're supposed to go through. Thank the Lord that I can be here with you today. Okay, I understand that. I'm not saying that they're immoral laws. But I want you to think like a Christian, especially on this issue. We were criminals towards the law of God. And God sent his son as a missionary so that we could be saved. Yes, they broke the law in coming into this country. But there is one responsibility that we have above all as a Christian people, and that is the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might be transformed. What would happen if we were so intentional with these people that they were saying to themselves, my people need this, and they go back home and start churches and plant churches and see people grow in their grace? Revival would break out. What would happen with our own body if we saw the soul more than we saw the political issue? Of, of, of our own people being so affected by bringing the gospel to a people group that's now here that they're like, I'm going, and I don't care what the cost, I'm gonna see the power of Christ in that country through these words of proclamation. And you've got all of this preparation of already having known these people, of serving with them. You know the cultural ins and outs because you've been trying to administer the gospel to these people who were illegal in our country. Oh, my friends, we, we are so distracted from the primary purpose of our Christian communities. It is not politics first, it is Christ first, the gospel first, the power of God in our lives to transform those things that we are enjoying right now as Christian people. And will we not share them with those that don't have it? The power of proclamation, let us be sure that we are not turning that conviction off when we think about all these different things. The homosexual, sexual issues, our church is on the same page with, with respect to what we're teaching. I just wonder if we really have that sense of conviction with the gospel towards these who are illegal immigrants in our country. The principle of proclamation is the last one. Elijah and Elisha spoke and many believed and many rejected. It's really actually quite fascinating two of the best and the most amazing prophets of their day, and you have this belief and rejection scenario. Isaiah the prophet was told that people would hear, but their judgment would be that they would not listen. Man, I just, I don't know about you guys, but that's like, hey, I'm gonna send you out to do missions and you're gonna fail, <laughs> right? Like nobody's gonna listen to you, Isaiah, and that's gonna be the fruit. And yet he preached. Jesus preached a message and somehow God rescued Jesus from being thrown off a cliff. Jesus left that, pray, that place and preached throughout Israel and droves of people sought after him. We see this change, we see this connection of, of sometimes people receive and sometimes people reject. Acts chapter two, Peter preached a message and thousands come to Christ. Philip explains the gospel to an Ethiopian official uh, by himself just reading that and this man believes and is baptized. And here's the thing we have to remember with this particular principle, and that is that God's word always bears fruit. He just gets to decide the kind of fruit that it will bear. You see, sometimes our proclamation of the gospel is a judgment upon people because they have rejected Christ so much that God is letting them experience. 
the hardness of their hearts. But that's not for us to decide. Ours is simply to preach the gospel and let God do what he wants to do with his word. And it's not just for salvation, but think about your own particular life and how God has used the word of God in your life so many times to convict you. The principle of proclamation applied to our own lives. Several years ago, a young man reading this word and struggling with the fact that I knew God was Catch, was pulling me towards ministry. And, and I, was, I was at a place of complete misery, and I'm like, okay, God, I'll do whatever. I'll even go to Africa. That was like the furthest place in the world that I could think of. But I just needed joy in my soul. So I'm kind of flipping through the scriptures, trying to find something, God, I just need you to show me. I land on this text, and with almost like anvil from the sky experience, you wanted to know what I want you to do? I'm going to use Christ's calling, Christ's ministry work to show you what I want you to do. And then it was years of development and God just showing me, but that's surrender. That's how God used this particular text in my life so many years ago. And I wonder, my friends, as you're considering the word of God, what work is taking place in your soul now through this text that you're gonna have a choice to make, obedience or rejection. We all know what we're supposed to do, but getting there sometimes is half the battle, right? I would just beckon you to rest again in the mercy of Christ. Enjoy him. Let him take the wheel of your life and steer you to where he wants you to be. He's created you, he's designed you, he's prepared you. He can put everything in your life that is necessary to accomplish the work that he wants done in the world through you. Will you receive from him? It takes, with, it takes first uh, willingness to be humble and to receive his direction. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you've given us, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be found faithful, faithful to your word faithful to our responsibilities as Christians. Lord, cause your favor to be upon our country so that your word might go forth in power and we might be able to see many lives changed. Do that work here, we pray, in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>